Jesus said, take the stone away. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there's a stench because he's been there four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upwards and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I've said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and his feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from the triune God. Amen. The people of Israel back in the book of Ezekiel faced a sad, dark, and disheartening and despairing time as they spent their years captive in the realm of Babylon. Removed from the land of promise, they had no hope of ever returning to the true ancestral home where they could be covenant children again of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Love and friendship and community were entirely lost to them, like Mary and Martha felt so lost and alone after the presence of their loving brother had disappeared. In chapter 6 of Ezekiel, God promised that he would bring a sword against his people till all their bones had been scattered, and here now is the vision of it. In other words, this, this people who were held captive knew that the only possible adult destiny that they had for themselves was to perish in a strange and foreign land. To this discouraged group, Ezekiel addresses to prophesy his vision in the chapter that we read. The prophet sees dried remains of a horrific slaughter either by battle or some kind of mass holocaust. The Lord then begins by challenging for hope in the face of irre irrevocable destruction. Mortal, can these bones live again? The NRSV uses the word mortal, but literally God says, son of man, can these bones live again? Favorite designation that Christ used for himself. Ezekiel doesn't know what to answer, so he says, Lord, only you can know. God only knows. It's enough. God doesn't wait for the prophet's faith or affirmation before he acts. He expects Ezekiel to do his part, to speak forth. Thus, reconstitution of dead bodies unfolds in stages. Noise, rattling, bones, sinews flesh or meat, then skin, and finally breath. Original creation of humans from the soil is nuanced here. Only in this passage, God is reconstituting an entire slain nation, and the promise is plainly shown. Death itself cannot destroy the intentions of God. The psalmist sings, therefore my heart is glad, my whole being rejoices. My flesh dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. And you know the famous lines from Job where he affirms that I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last he will stand on the earth and after my skin has been completely destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God, I will see God for myself. My own eyes shall behold not another. We tend to apply these scripture passages to our individual lives as we should, but God envisions a final resurrection of all God's people en masse. And so why does God keep on redeeming God's chosen even after death? 
Well, there's a scripture I used several weeks ago from Deuteronomy 7, and I think it nails it. He says, it was not because you were a more numerous people that the Lord set his heart on you and chose you. You were the fewest of all people. It was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath that he swore to your ancestors. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who maintains covenant loyalty with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. A generation may fall, but a thousand generations will rise. Now fast forward to the reading of the New Testament. Every resurrection of Jesus, of Jesus, resuscitations rather, is an emblem of that final day to come. And in particular of Jesus' own personal resurrection, the kind of first fruits to God. Looking at the story of Lazarus, we see at the first that Jesus intentionally delayed his going. There's some speculation that even if Jesus had trekked all the way to Bethany right away, he may not have made it in time. But as it was, he waited, he waited, he delayed, presumably to be self-assured that Lazarus indeed had died. Folks in this week's text study asked why. Why did Jesus delay? Well, it's speculative, of course, but the postponement necessitated a miracle of resurrection, not healing. The raising of Lazarus back to life so infuriated the Jewish leaders that they began in earnest to plot Jesus' death. In other words, by delaying his coming, Jesus created this tipping point that would lead him directly to Holy Week and Calvary. The disciples knew it. Hence, Thomas's under the breath comment, let's all go and die with him. Jesus meets Mary first, then, excuse me, Martha first, then Mary. He engages with each of them according to how they were processing their grieving. Mary processes with conversation and dialogue and questions, so Jesus meets her with dialogue. That was Martha. Mary processes her grieving with sobs, and I can only imagine Jesus meeting that with tears of his own, as it says, them falling on each other's necks, unable to restrain the emotion. Onlookers gaze. They notice a singular feature of Jesus above everything else that he says or does. They observe to each other, see how he loved him. See how Jesus loves. Jesus says to, Mar uh, to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life, and he could have just as easily said, love is the resurrection and the life. Covenant love and redemption, meaning resurrection, are inextricably conjoined. Just as we read in Deuteronomy or this passage from the Song of Songs, set me as a seal upon your hearts and as a seal upon your arm. Love is as strong as death. Passion fierces the grave. It flashes, its flashes are the flashes of a raging flame. When love meets people, new life always comes. That can be the only result. Of course, in both readings, the one from Ezekiel and from John, the lessons are about hope. The prophet's vision inspires hope for a national restoration in the face of their present despair. The hope-filled miracle of raising Lazarus will sustain Jesus' followers all through Holy Week in that time of Calvary, in Jesus' passion and death. Hope is definitely present, but I want to underscore that love is present all the more. As I say goodbyes this morning, I'm confident of a growing hope that you have as a congregation. During last week's story time, I promised you, oh, the places you'll go. What do you want to look like in the next five or 10 or 25 years? You can write your own ticket and you will. 
The story of Agnes Day is only at the very beginning. That inspires a great hope in me for you. But while I've been privileged to be your interim pastor, the most important piece has always been the love that can be shared. Yours with me, mine with you, getting to know you, getting to companion together with you. Love is where the life is. Love is where the resurrection life is. On a Sunday morning, love shows up any number of places during worship. It shows up in the declaration of forgiveness, which I already told you is the most important thing that I do on a Sunday morning, is pronounce the forgiveness of sins. But a close second, maybe uh, a co-equal, is sharing Christ's love with you and my love with you during Holy Communion. There are all kinds of ways that I've sought to provide pastoral care and love while I've been here, mainly by showing up and connecting at regular meetings and events. But if we can't connect anywhere else, if our paths don't cross, they certainly do cross during Holy Communion at the Lord's table. Here's how it goes. I stand out in front and you come forward. I have the tray of bread in my hands. And as you come forward, you put place your hands in a cup. And as I reach out to you with the bread, I place it in your cupped hands. I give, it a, give your hands a gentle squeeze. And then I look you directly in the eye and I say, the body of Christ given for you or the body of Christ broken for you. And in that way, in that moment of time, there's a connection. And I'm telling you, I love you. And you're telling me back, thank you very much, I love you too. And you go on. That's how we do it. That has been a special and important moment every Sunday that I've been here. So that's how I want to say my end to this message, not with a goodbye, but more with a strong hope for you for the coming days and with the words, I love you on my lips. New, fresh resurrection life from the Lord is bound to follow. Amen.